Hello, my name is Rachel Geller, and today I'm your host of Elder Exploitation, Follow the Money. To introduce myself, I am the author of legislation in the state of Massachusetts that was passed into law in 2010. The name of the legislation is an act protecting nursing home residents, and it's also known as Sally's Law. The intent of the legislation is to provide elderly people who are entering nursing homes a copy of their rights and their entitlements under Mass State Law in a brochure that is presented in easily readable and layperson's language for the elder and the family to completely and fully understand. Um, nursing homes are now required to hand this brochure out to every resident and family entering a nursing home and the nursing home is required to get a signature and send a copy of the form indicating that the rights and entitlements were received to the Department of Public Health. So this legislation ensures that nursing home residents and their families are fully aware of their rights and if they feel their rights are not being met there are avenues explained to the um, residents and their families that they can pursue in order to file a complaint or get their complaints listened to through the nursing home. My guests today are Kendra Cooper who is an elder care attorney in the state of Massachusetts and also an educator and Jane Krieger who is here to provide first-hand observations of our often flawed processes in dealing with elders and problems elders may face in terms of financial exploitation and abuse. So today to start off our conversation I wanted to just define a few terms. Um, the first is isolation and this is when either a facility or abusers or even unscrupulous family members will isolate an elder completely and fully from the family to the point that the elder cannot make contact with people outside of the circle. The other term is gaslighting and this is when facilities or scammers or other participants in the scam or financial abuse will make the one person who really cares about the elder and is fighting for the elder's rights feel like they're crazy and this this maybe you're paranoid this can't be what's really going on and this is a common theme in elder abuse and financial exploitation and I'd also like to talk a little bit about manipulation this is something that scammers and financial exploiters will do to the elder and perhaps some of the caring family members to change the story, to present things in a little bit of a different way, to say things are which really are not happening. And manipulation is very, very common in the world of elder abuse. So having said that, I'd like to start off with talking to Kendra Cooper with some of the real life cases that you've experienced. Mm -hmm. I think too when you talked about manipulation, um, sometimes some of those characters, um, some of these characteristics, it, there's a pattern out there and often you look at um, isolation, um, you know, you have gaslighting, but in, in some of the laws you'll see isolation, uh, manipulation, uh, coercion, intimidation, um, and there's a whole list of five of them, and then there's misrepresentation. And one of the ways that they misrepresent to elders what's, um, what's going on. The way they can control them is if they isolate them, then they can control the information that the elder has. The elder may suddenly not be getting any mail or uh, no phone calls, or phone calls are monitored, and uh, the elder has no idea. You know, how could this happen? You know, and then they become very nervous about telling anyone what's going on or any of their, their concerns, uh, particularly with elderly who um, they don't have to have dementia. I see a lot in, in the news and, and I see frequently uh, protective services, the police will be aware of, well, you have a dementia uh, um, patient or dementia, a person with dementia, and, um, but they don't realize that you don't have to have dementia to be manipulated, to be exploited. 
Um, even younger people can be exploited. Uh, but and you I believe have to you, be vulnerable. And your mother, who did not have dementia or Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. I believe was isolated through manipulation of the phone. Can you talk to that the a little bit? The phone and that, yeah. Uh, once she was, well actually even when she was still in Massachusetts, she was. She was, um, someone else had moved in, we all thought everything was fine. And, uh, but that, that becomes an issue when you call and you can't reach the older person. And if the older person is legally blind, as my mother was, uh, unless people know that, they might think that she is paranoid or she's afraid to do something or, um, you know, it, it's very important that people who deal with elderly, uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, you know, people who are uh, around them regularly, even in their home. And I think one of the most important things is for elders to be able to stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and Massachusetts in 2006 passed something called the Equal Choice Bill, which says that if a Massachusetts elder financially qualifies for Massachusetts to uh, provide and to pay for a nursing home, they will also pay for that elder to stay in their home with care if the elder has a home. And way, all too often, the elder is persuaded either by a hospital when they fall, usually there's an incident, or a, um, a social worker, or someone who tells them, oh, well, you should sell your home. or put your home under a lien with a, um, an assisted living and the assisted living will gradually, um, they will become owners as you, the longer you stay in the assisted living. The problem is what happens when the amount of money that your home was worth is, um, you know, reaches the amount of cost for living in the assisted living. Then it can be a very tricky situation. Um, I've unfortunately seen situations where uh, an elder will then, uh, for some reason, the assisted living will say, oh, they're a danger to themselves or others. Or they'll say, oh, they need, they need more care than they have. And sometimes that's really not documented. Families should really get second opinions on this. They should make sure that they've got records and they always, always should get their medical records on a regular basis. Because sometimes they may see things in those records that they are totally unaware of things that they should have gotten permission to get and didn't. And uh, it's very important, you know. And for speaking of getting permission to get and not receiving that permission, I believe, Jane, you have some experience with um, medications being given that were specifically not. Um, yes, we had no idea. We were the family. And like Rachel, it was, uh, um, uh, Sissy was uh, my husband's cousin. And I was there at least once a week and we had prepared so that she could go home to her small condo which is what she wanted. She was still acting as the trustee of two buildings and actively managing it with another woman which they had since the 1970s. And unbeknownst to us she tripped on a stool and they called us and we went and she went to the hospital. And when she got transferred for physical therapy it was only after we received the medical records when she had died that a psychiatrist had prescribed um, Respidone for, um, I think that's how you say it, for schizophrenia and a drug for alcohol-induced dementia, I think, and she didn't drink. And in the medical record, she said, well, that would be hard for me to have that doctor because I don't drink. And he thought that was just, she was making it up. So we had no idea. and. She had her insurance, she was very independent, she was still acting as a trustee, and we just had no idea. And, of course, they never got informed consent, which they are required to do, yes. but it was so unlike her personality, it's not anything we would have looked for. If she had a question, she would call, and my husband would take time off from work and come in with me, and I went every week. And we always did things together. If she asked me a question, I'd say, well, let's go and find out. And we'd go to you know, the fiscal services or to the meeting, or we would go and ask, well, where do we get this information? And they would tell us, and we would go together. And so she you was always- those care meetings, because Absolutely. sometimes I, I meet people who said, oh, well, you know, they scheduled it for a time. We couldn't go, you know, but they, but they have it in the records. And no, they told us and we did yeah, go. Okay. But 
they didn't tell us. They'd say, it's well, you know, she doesn't want to be in research. And they don't say anything. And it was only after she died, like five years later, that there's uh, a research department apparently on the fifth floor. So I went up there, and it's world-renowned research. And the doctor who's in charge of the research, which got transferred from another hospital, she's on her medical record. And then another time, of course, we didn't know about the drugs, and Sissy didn't either. Well, you, and it's I impossible said, for the families you? to know if the facilities are following the law. Right. How, how could you possibly know? Particularly you, you when know. it's so contrary to their personality and what they're actually everyday living is. She actively managed two buildings. I think to Kendra's on point call about constantly getting the medical records mm. is something I recommend a lot to my yeah. clients because that's really the only way you know what's going on mm -hmm. often. And I think um, a lot of people don't realize that they can request the medical records and that the facilities are required mm -hmm. to give you those medical records. Not only that, but within a certain amount of time. It has right. to be a reasonable amount of time. Right. So it is a very important tool for us and the public to have. And what we found out was even more astonishing is that I remember the social worker, someone asked me a question. So I said, well, let's go and ask her. And we went into her room. We always did that. And I asked Sissy. And, the, and she looked at me. I said, Sissy, can you hear me? She said, not that well. So I said, did you give her an ear test? I, apparently, hospitals get paid. The more procedures they have, the more they get reimbursed. So uh, I learned this later. Um, yeah, kind of. Unfortunately, so we I all said, "Did you?" Later. So she had all these tests, yeah. and I said, "Did you test your hearing?" And they said, uh, "No." So they, I said, "Would you please test your hearing?" Um, and uh, she had wax in her ear. So how could she? And this was three months after they had called her schizophrenic and a big long reports. And. So, how, I mean, isn't that proof that she can't, how could she consent if she can't hear them? Well, if she can't hear and <laughs> can't answer the questions that are designed to right. determine schizophrenia, it's pretty suspect that and of course she a diagnosis give was made consent. on that base. Yeah. And, of course, I didn't know any of this until we got the medical records after she died because things just didn't make any sense. Nothing followed through. My uncle happens to be a lawyer who's retired, so... He kind of helped us. He said, oh, well, you go and do this, and you go and do that. I know these um, diagnoses are often done not in accordance with law. And I believe, right. Kendra, you had that experience with your oh, yeah. mother mm -hmm. where she was diagnosed just with, with her, but it, with other dementia. people, too. I mean, yeah. in Massachusetts uh -huh. as well. Um, there was uh, there were one of my clients, actually, in, in whom we, we all tried to help so that because we felt that staying in the home was the most important thing mm -hmm. for this couple, this older couple. And um, this particular person, she did have dementia. I run into quite a few people who really don't have dementia, but sometimes there are diagnoses that are used, like if there's no hearing, they will score poorly on something called the MOCA Montreal Assessment Test or the Mini Mental State Exam. Or and difficulty seeing. Or difficulty mm -hmm. seeing. And if you've got a test that, that is heavily visual, then they're not going to score well. And it it's really can be a frightening thing. Um, but I find that in this one, one particular case, uh, the, elderly, uh, the elderly woman uh, was, did have dementia, but her husband was very concerned about giving her antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. And some of them are what you call black box drugs. And the black box means that they're capable of killing an elderly person if they take them. Uh, lots of times families don't know that, but now with, with the ability to go on the internet, people really should check up once yes. they get their records. And you don't actually, one of the things with getting records, and I want to make sure that I made this point, when you, make re when you get your records, uh, it's important to, um, to, to be aware that sometimes they'll charge exorbitant prices. Uh, because they want to obstruct your access to get your records or uh, your loved one's records. However, one of the things you can do is also you can go in there and now that we have cell phones, you can take photographs, you can sit there mm. in an office and just sit there and go through it and carve out the time and take photographs of what you see on certain pages or you can, depending on your phone. Right, you are, you you are entitled do. to read the records on premises. And well, I, will, I do right. find that many facilities don't offer that, somebody right. will say, I request the records, anything. okay, that'll be $700, mm. because right. there, it might be a tome, 
and people don't realize that they can sit in the office and read through the records on the premises of the facility that is completely within mm -hmm. your rights. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. I, it's, um, it's very important that people understand that because it's very easy when you've never been in this kind of chaotic situation before and you've ever a loved one who seems to be acting very differently and, and you figure this is the decline now, sometimes the decline is caused by medications. And I think mm. speaking and to patterns, the records, yeah. um, a pattern of um, elder abuse, which I think is really important for the public to realize, um, you had the you saw the pattern with this um, couple with the antipsychotics, right. and you saw this pattern with the risperdone. And I can speak to my own personal situation with my aunt. I saw the same pattern with Seroquel, which mm -hmm. is an antipsychotic. And I think people need to be very very aware that these drugs require permission. Right. Um, and often. I was involved in a case where the elderly person was actually given a blank form and said, please sign this for any drugs we may need to give you. This way oh, it's yeah. already signed. It was presented as a right. convenience. It's like a blank check. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so yeah. I would urge family thing. members and residents in facilities not to sign something that doesn't list the exact drug on it. This is a common thing. It's, it's presented as an easy way. This way, if we need to give mm -hmm. your loved one a medication we don't have to track you down oh that sounds so helpful so be sure of what you're signing and be aware that any drug that is an antipsychotic requires permission they can't give those drugs without permission and if somebody is on antipsychotics it then becomes very easy to manipulate coerce intimidate exploit that person. So it's very important. And often they want to do the antipsychotics because they zone them out, they drug them, and they make them easy care. There are some really good approaches to uh, Alzheimer residents uh, that, are, that redirect them. And people who are trained know how to do that, but it can be labor intensive. It's much better for the elder, but um, you know, often they would much rather have them. If you go into a nursing home sometimes, they're, they're just clusters of people slumped down and, and their eyes are, gay, are glazed. And it's, it's really a sad situation. And often they'll, they'll be clustered around a nurse's area. Um, that's not supposed to happen like that, but that's most convenient and often they're understaffed. I mean, there's so many things as a, as a, uh, a, a loved one, that when you have one in the, in the uh, facilities, it's really important to look for those things. Um, I was just trying to think with some of the records who there was some, oh, I know, I wanted to get back to that couple that we had Seroquel. Um, one, there, there was a strange dynamic that I had not heard of until we encountered this. Because the husband did not want antipsychotics given to his wife, he wanted her redirected. He had done a lot of research and he would regularly write notes and write emails to people at the, at uh, say a hospital or the psych ward or whatever. What, what was happening was his wife would end up having a problem, and they would give a new medication. She'd have a problem, then she would go to a facility, a hospital, that would supposedly you know, help her, uh, help manage them and get her stabilized. Then they would want to send her out to a nursing home. And she went to many nursing homes because the husband said, I'm not going to have her have antipsychotics. They are bad for her, they do not work, but the nursing homes would want to put him on. They just figured they could put her on these medications. Um, and then when she wasn't, uh, when, when he refused, then they would ship her back to the hospital, the original one that was going back and forth. And it was musical chairs with this poor woman, um, including one time during a snowstorm. And I went with him to the, uh, to the nursing home because they said, we're going to kick her out today in the middle of a, a snowstorm. So we went there and we waited to go see her. Meanwhile, they were loading her into, a, in a, into an ambulance and bringing her back to this, this uh, facility. Um, unfortunately, one thing that happened, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, um, one time when she was sent back, the hospital was very much aware that he did not want her to have Seroquel. They knew that this could stop her heart. Indeed, it did. They sent her in. The emergency room gave her Seroquel. Her heart stopped. As she had dementia, she um, 
she did have something called a DNR, do not resuscitate in her records. But they didn't honor that that time because they knew that they had given her Seroquel. And they had, um, and so they revived her. She had broken ribs. She had, oh um, I can't remember how many years after that she lived, but that incident actually caused the hospital, which was going for a guardianship, to get control of it away from the husband because they wanted to be able to give her the antipsychotics and then and oversee her. So they were going to, they actually went to court, and this is becoming a more common practice mm -hmm. of hospitals and institutions going against the family's wishes and against the person's wishes to get a guardianship so that then they can drug the person and then get the person drugged elsewhere. And then the family, and they can isolate them, they can keep the family away. Right. That's how the court system kind of well, you know, combines I, that I know way. you've been doing a lot of research on guardianship abuse, and I know you've found a lot of patterns, and you've studied a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Um, well, I, I've been looking more nationally because I know of cases in Massachusetts where, where there have been guardian abuses, and, and often the guardian abuse is more a facility trying to get to, to go to court and try to get control. Um, there are problems too, but, but from a national point of view, they have this. Um, sometimes you have to look at, at a common scenario is an older person, and it's very easy to see where an older person lives in the community. Um, they'll, there's sometimes a things called street books or whatever, and you can actually see the, the birth date or the, the year. And so people, who are developers, um, realtors, these people, um, they, they're interested in where property is going, where is it likely to turn over. But they're also, sometimes there are groups of people that work together uh, to financially exploit an elder. And that could be uh, lawyers targeting families. You see a lot in statistics about families do this to the elderly person, but I'm beginning to look at it as there are groups of people who target families. And, um, and those people, uh, when an elder loses his rights or her rights, the elder is very vulnerable. And, um, but so are the families. And it can even go so far as a very trusted um, oh. community member. Um, oh, yes. Maybe, I, maybe somebody in a religious institution or somebody right. in the community who... Trusted in church. Who works with elders, and I see this Council a lot on aging too. members. I mean, yes. you know, it, it's, you don't want people to, uh, to fear everyone, but at this point... But be aware. Sometimes they are aware. Um, I was just reading, uh, there's a book, there's several books out now, but one of the books that I, is, is called The Whole of uh, the Wolf at the door, and it's uh, Undue Influence and Elder Financial Abuse. Came out last year by a California lawyer, Michael Hackard. And um, there's a case in here that I didn't know about, and it has to do with New Hampshire. Hmm. Um, it, it happened, I think, in uh, 2015, a police mi misconduct. I mean, you know, you're taught that you should trust the police. Um, but many of them have not gotten training in financial exploitation. And likewise, nor has, have many people who are in protective services. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's called um, Elder Protective Services, and there are, I think, 22 of them. Um, and then there are our um, elder services, like we have Mystic Valley in Reading, this Merrimack Valley up in, New Ham up in uh, Lawrence, and they kind of share people. Um, nationally, there, there is a real push to get more training for these people because um, sometimes they don't know, but sometimes, like this particular case he's got on page 30, <laughs> has to do with a Portsmouth, New Hampshire police sergeant who uh, in 2015 ended up being fired for the way he had, had um, persuaded and manipulated uh, an elderly woman who had 2.7 million in property. And he was able to shift that. He took her on trips to the casinos. He did things. And then some other police were actually looking too, you know, um, eventually. And then there was a policeman who was a whistleblower. And things happened to him that you would not have expected for someone who's a whistleblower. But this case is, is in this book. And, um, and he, he just talks about how this one policeman, you know, there were so many red flags. And that's why sometimes books like this are really helpful because you can, you, once you see the red flags and the groups of people that can work together, um, a lawyer that might 
uh, you know, might look the other way and, and fill out a uh, health care proxy or a power of attorney. Um, and then suddenly that person has the power to decide what drug this person is going to have. And many attorneys benefit from some of these trusts well, the way they're set up. So. Sometimes they actually they actually <laughs> put themselves in there. But sometimes just the fact that that their family, when somebody wakes up, if somebody wakes up to wait a minute, who is this person that's visiting Ma all the time, or or who is this? Uh, is this is and it turns out to be a sweetheart scammer, someone who says, oh, let's go there and pretends to adore this person, but in reality is setting them up to get hold of their property and to maybe figure out what the situation is with the mm -hmm. family. And can you define and, for the audience a little bit the term sweetheart scammer? Okay, a sweetheart scammer is a person who pretends to, uh, if, often they'll, they'll target widowers or widows. Uh, but, and they can be the same age. You, you picture that these people might be 20, 30 years old, you know, a beautiful, beautiful um, attractive, Marilyn Monroe-like person. They don't have to be. And in fact, often men will, uh, you know, will, will target them. Sometimes they target people in church. I mean, these are, these are all areas that uh, previously I would have thought, you know, this, oh, go contact your minister or contact your church uh, your deacon or something like that. Now I know that think about abuse of children and then think about abuse of elders because where do abusers go with children? They go to playgrounds. They go to where the children are. The same thing happens with elders. And only elders sometimes are mentally fine, but they maybe can't see, or maybe they can't hear. Right. And sometimes it doesn't have to be you're on the, the, the conveyor belt downward. It can be something as simple as wax in their ears. Yeah. But you yeah. know, and sometimes at senior centers, I've seen uh, hearing aid companies come in, and you know, I don't necessarily hear them. I went one time with my father when there was somebody there, and. Um, and we knew some of his friends couldn't hear very well. But we also knew that some were, you know, they probably had wax. And um, we found that uh, they didn't really check for that. And so there's money going right at where the, the, where the seniors go. You know, at lunchtime, this person's gonna be there with a booth and you wanna have them checked for free, you could have your ears checked. But there's, so often there's money at the end of this. And in terms of all of this, these groups of people who may work together, mm -hmm. um, for financial exploitation purposes. I believe, was there a report that was done in Massachusetts or a oh, study yeah. that indicated that indeed many of our agencies or protectors of the elders have not really um, trained in no, identifying financial exploitation? Yeah, in uh, 2014, October 23rd, there was a, uh, it was the end of a two year study, there was a special commission of the legislature that, um, that met and, and evaluated uh, how protective services was operating in Massachusetts. And they absolutely came across that Massachusetts desperately needed to train these people to spot this kind of financial exploitation. This is not the simple kind that is, uh, you know, like you get a phone call from the IRS telling you you're going to be robbed or you're, get, you're going to have to go to court in two days and they're going to arrest you, and, and which we are getting now these days, yeah. sometimes two and three. Uh, this is the kind of uh, manipulation and approach that, that happens over time. Nationally, they see a five-year span. It's an average of spy, five years to get that sweetheart scammer or get that person who befriends somebody, who, who acts like they're going to help you get to the grocery store, or get to, um, to, to the exercise, or get to the senior center. Not everybody can go in those vans. You know, that, I mean, there are yeah. vans that come and go, but, but so, so people who, um, who are sweetheart scammers or people who befriend people, and families need to watch for that. So they need to really be looking for patterns. And right. it might be subtle, but it might be long term. And where did this friend come from? How did the elder get to know this friend? Right. What's going on? Maybe I should investigate. So mm -hmm. we don't want to red flag every nice person who wants to help an elder, but right. be aware, be cautious, kind of keep an eye out, and, and do your due diligence. Right, and sometimes um, even looking at things like credit cards. Um, I remember looking at a credit card uh, bill one time and seeing on the very same day four different vehicles gassed up. Now it's one thing if the person is taking, you know, the elder someplace, you know, and, and one person, but four, which is probably a hundred dollars, you know, and at the same gas station, 
under the same card, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Or, or some of the larger places like, say, a, a Walmart where someone has brought them to do something. Um, even, and when you get more into powers of attorney and, and, um, and guardianship, start looking at those bills. But many times you can't. You'll get, uh, you know, an assessment or, you know, a monthly, uh, you know, a report or something. And it doesn't tell you the breakdown. So, you know, people could be buying things, and it doesn't matter. It, you don't know who they're really buying them for. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one receipt that I looked at one time uh, showed that uh, an elder had gotten a very expensive $150 pair of, of shoes. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting, but on the receipt. There's a red flag. Well, yeah. well, but that's, you know, sometimes there are, there are kinds that you need that are very sturdy and, and they're well made and they give them lots of support. But what cued me was that the, I knew the elder's foot was about a nine and a half. And this was actually on this, on this uh, receipt for an 11 and a half. And I knew, all right, I don't care how much the foot swells, it's not going to be that much. And then I realized that the person who was the guardian or the person who had the, the power of attorney had purchased. It's pretty likely it purchased. And that's themselves. very common where the guardians right. or the power of attorney um, get it's almost use oversight. small things like clothing purchases, sneaker purchases, things that are maybe a hundred dollars, right. two hundred dollars. So it's easy to fly under the radar. So that's right. another um, scenario where you really have to look closely at the bills and where this money is going, because buying clothes on the elderly's um, using the Kinda elderly's fine. assets, yeah. you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but doing that for five years, you can easily rack up quite a, a drain there on the elderly's assets, and somebody can be sort of enjoying, you know, a new wardrobe or taking road trips oh, yeah. on the elderly's dime or buying a new pair of sneakers, uh, getting a, ma a meal at a restaurant. All of these things add up. Right, they do. And, and sometimes elderly, um, you know, they're lonely. And people who manipulate know how to play that card. They're, and sometimes people will move into the house. And maybe one or two will move into the house. And the elderly person doesn't necessarily want to know. I mean, um, I was looking at statistics there. Uh, right now, I just heard a, a, a webinar uh, a few weeks ago that every day 10,000 people turn 62 a day in, mass in the U.S. And so we have a problem that is that is extending and is expanding, and we need to uh, we need to know how to look at this kind of uh, this kind of problem. Um, I, I was answering your question, and then I, was, I my eye caught some another point that um, that I, I really feel is is important that people understand how it's done. Manipulation is one one of the ways the loneliness factor. Um, and, and the uh, credit card bills, um, there was another one, there was a series of tactics that once you know to look for them, you will, um, you'll be able to, to identify them, the kinds of, uh, oh, surrender of oversight, the new friend is one, suspicious withdrawals. Now, now bank accounts, um, if there's some way you can even monitor it, that's really helpful. Um, if suddenly the uh, jewelry, the you know some of their assets are gone, um, and you know just talk to them, and you know people have said to me, look, an elderly person has the right to give away what she wants, and many people do before, but think about who they know, how long they've known that person, how long has that person been there, have they moved in, um, because it's very difficult. I, I've encountered sometimes people in protective services say, well, the elderly person, um, they don't want to, to press charges. They don't want to say that I don't want this person living here. Because well, what will they do? And, and that's the loneliness factor. Elderly people, many of them are vulnerable and they are sometimes afraid. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how much the world has changed in an elderly person's life, they may not be technologically savvy right. or up on all of the latest gadgets and, and banking things that we do now with apps and online. So it is easy if somebody really wants to fool an elder and make it appear as if they're helping mm -hmm. that elder to, to get away with it as far as technology and the elder feeling vulnerable. 
I think that the uh, the banks are becoming better at, at uh, training some of them. The Consumer Financial Protection nationally um, has has done more training for tellers. Um, but I, th I still think at the bottom level, we, we do have a problem. I did want to say um, that uh, just in October of last year, there was a, uh, an act that was a federal legislation that was passed, Elder Abuse Prevention and Prosecution Act, and this is federal legislation which will be training FBI agents and it will be training prosecutors because a problem that... What is it, Kendra? What, this is called the Elder Abuse Prevention Prosecution Act, and it was passed um, federally. Um, uh, Trump, President Trump, signed it on October 18th, 2017, and it's going into effect right now. Um, and one of the factors that I thought was good that they had this in the federal level, um, that they're training prosecutors, because in Maine in 2015, they also did a report similar to Massachusetts on the need for training elder protective services people. But in Maine, they not only, and this was an attorney general's task force that came out with this report, they not only do they, um, did they say they don't have training in financial exploitation, that their adult protective services people desperately need that. I mean, they can see bruises, bed sores, that kind of thing, yes. that kind of abuse. But financial exploitation... It's more subtle. It's, it's subtle, it's continuous, it can be long-term becoming entrenched. And um, in, their, in their case, though, in the main task force final report on financial exploitation of elderly, they also included law enforcement needing training. Because if yeah. people go to law enforcement, I'll see, there'll, there'll be ads in Massachusetts called, you know, if you think or you see this, call someone and one of the numbers they say to call is 1-800-AGE-INFO, 1-800-AGE-INFO. However, when people call that number, and I believe now Mass, UMass Medical is dealing with that, um, but the problem is if you call the police, they, they go to protective services. Um, but if they don't know what they're doing, particularly at the lowest level, then there's no way it's going to be prosecuted. Well, I've had um, experiences myself with the police and financial exploitation and times that I've had. Um, I've been the POA or been a personal oh, representative or um, an executor of an estate and I've had issues with unscrupulous family members and mm -hmm. I have called the police and the police really often did not know what to do. And they would say, we will bring the will. I need to see this. I need to see that. And I would provide all of the paperwork but they didn't seem to really have the tools to address the problem that was happening with a, a family timeline. member who was really not acting in the elder's best interest, whether it was financial exploitation, um, medical abuse with antipsychotics. I find the police um, were not able to really handle the situation and did not know what to do. So I'm pleased to see um, law enforcement involved in this new act signed well, by President Trump. That's yeah, at the federal level, I am too, yes. because I think, and, and unfortunately there are, there are cases where people might be in Florida for a vacation or they might be, and then they might fall or get sick. And Florida has a serious problem. You know, there's, it's in the news all yeah, the time yeah. with appointments uh, when someone falls in a, either a hospital or a nursing home or a rehab will contact the court, the court will appoint a guardian, the guardian will then isolate the family member in Florida from the family up in Massachusetts, and then they will, they will garnish their assets, they'll just they'll, uh, you know, annex their assets. And meanwhile, the family up here has to deal with Florida lawyers. I mean, economically, it's an industry. Well, I think in general, know? moving an elder out of state by oh, scammers yes. or people who try, want to take advantage of the elder in some way has been a tactic that's been employed by these people for a while. Right, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's really a problem. And, and um, to just continue with, with Maine, um, in their, their final attorney general's report, they also talked about training court personnel and judges. And they admitted that prosecutors had no idea what to do. Um, that, and they, so they're not enforcing. But um, one of the things that, as I learn more about different parts of the country and how they're dealing with it, California has some very interesting, more, I would say, uh, 
more current in, in certain parts of it, really prosecuting this, someone in San Diego who's been prosecuting these kinds of cases for uh, 20 years, and he travels all around the country giving workshops. Um, but um, his name's Paul Greenberg, and um, I know that, uh, that sometimes there are, are other things that we need to do with, uh, you know, with, uh, sometimes we need more tools in our toolbox, mm -hmm. I guess is what I'm saying. I discovered that in Georgia, two years ago, they, uh, they passed a law and I'm following up to see how it's working, but they made it a felony. So it's not in the probate court as much as it's a felony for multiple people to work together to financially exploit an elder. And uh, that takes it into the criminal realm, which when you consider how they, um, how they take people's money and <laughs> use it for themselves, I think that's the correct and realm. how it's groups of people, because if an elder lives in a home and someone gets a guardianship appointed by a probate court, and then the guardian decides, oh, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell your home. I'm going to put you in a nursing home. That gives money to the nursing home. That gives money to the lawyer. It gives money to the realtor, um, the bank, the finance. I mean, I mean, it's just a, such a group of people that all economically benefit when an elder loses the civil rights. So I so. know we're winding down mm -hmm. to the end of our show. And before we end, I know, um, Kendra, you have some excellent books and resources oh, yeah. where people can research this and find more information on their own. So maybe before we end, mm -hmm. you provide some of that information for our audience. Well, there were a few, um, there, there were a few books. I mean, I, I already kind of showed you this yes. one, which I, I think it's written well for someone who's not a lawyer, but it's written by a lawyer. And he is, um, and he's a California lawyer. He, he writes something that I think the concepts you can understand regardless because every state seems to be different on, on how you deal with yeah. this and that's why you need to have, if you're gonna be in Florida, you better make sure that your Florida will is the same as your Massachusetts will and healthcare proxies as well. Um, and, um, and then another book that just came out this year is uh, Guardianships and the Elderly, The Perfect Crime, and it's by uh, Dr. Sam Sugar. Now, I have found that some of the parts of this do not apply to Massachusetts. I think he was trying to make it a generic book, mm -hmm. um, and so I would be careful about uh, adopting all of the descriptions. I know one of the things he talks about is determining whether somebody's of capacity or not. If there are teams of people, well, in Massachusetts and Maine, it's just a doctor. And sometimes in Maine, I learned that sometimes it's a dementia can be determined by just a speech pathologist. And that's crazy, but that's what really does happen. And sometimes a doctor will rely on it. So Maine's got uh, their own set of problems. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that Dr. Sam's book, um, Dr. Sam Sugars, he started, he's the founder of the Americans Against Abusive Probate Guardianships. It's a, it's a very active group based in Florida. Um, there are also, a, uh, so there's another one um, that, uh, there's some other organizations, uh, the National Center on, uh, on Law and Elder, Elder Rights, you can just Google those things, it's uh, based out of California. Uh, there's also Americans, uh, National Association to Stop Guardianship Abuse, which is called NASGA. I mean, all of these have, um, have things they're working on, and um, I think it's really important that people- To have uh, the information. Right. Yeah. yeah. And well, thank you. Else, Would you like to add anything, closing remarks before we end? Any? Um, no, I think it's very helpful for people to um, just to know what guardianship is mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, these books are excellent. And the more we all become educated, I think um, we'll be able to, I guess, defend ourselves. I know I'm no, a senior. And, and maybe, <laughs> maybe help our Our eyes one. have been opened. Yes. And right. Yeah. I think this helps open yes. everyone's eyes so we yeah. can advocate for ourselves even. Right. Oh, yeah. It's better for society as a whole. Right. So thank you, Kendra. Thank you, Jane. My name is Rachel Geller, and this has been a Q&A on elder exploitation. Follow the money.